Hello, everybody. Uh, we're coming to you live from New York City, an un undisclosed location in the UK. Um, I'm Liz Ngonzi, an international educator, speaker, executive coach, and consultant, enabling nonprofit leaders and entrepreneurs to reach their potential and increase their impact. We're all facing challenges today as never before, and we need connection and transformative thinking to keep all of us moving forward. We really do. Uh, earlier this week, I announced um, an ongoing a series of live broadcasts through LinkedIn Live and Periscope on Twitter that I'm developing to be as helpful and motivational as can be. To do so, not only will I draw from my own experience, about 20 years, um, and that of my extensive global network of experts, including Bernard Ross, who we're going to speak to today. Um, I also want to hear from all of you about the issues that are keeping up at night or the things that you're excited about that you want to learn more about as we kind of go through this, this, this transition period. And wherever you might be in this world, we're going to be able to appeal to you because I definitely appeal to, I, I look to work with a global audience, even though I'm based in New York City. So through these webinars, um, I aim to inspire, connect with, and activate you in order to help you create the transformation you seek for your organization, for yourself, or even your career. Uh, and the format's going to vary, but basically it'll be kind of like a little mini lecture uh, by me, um, and then we'll have an interview with an expert in fundraising. But today we're going to have, I mean, le the lecture is going to be from Bernard with questions interspersed from me, and then an open Q&A from all of you. So if you go ahead and tweet at me, um, at Liz and Gonzi or um, Bernard Ross, you'll be able to, he'll be able to share with you his contact details and, um, you know, or add your comments to LinkedIn. We'll be happy to respond to um, whatever questions you may have. So now let me just tell you about this extraordinary man who I just really so grateful to have here with me or remotely here with me from his manor home in the UK. Um, he's someone who I had the honor of meeting 10 years ago in South Africa when we were both invited by the South Southern Africa Institute of Fundraising to speak in their biannual convention in Mulder's Drift, South Africa, a really beautiful place. I think that's the cradle of humanity. Mm. And um, we've since we've kind of met in Kenya, we've met in Denmark, uh, in, in Holland and lots of different places, actually even in New York. Um, and so I'm really excited to have, have him on here, but let me tell you about his extraordinary background. It's just a snippet of what you, you know, what, what, what he's accomplished, but He's the director of the Management Center, a boutique management consultancy working worldwide for ethically driven organizations. His areas of expertise are strategic thinking, uh, change leadership, innovation, and strategic capacity. He also acts as a personal coach to a number of CEOs um, of large NGOs and international NGOs. And he's worked for over 20 years with the nonprofit organizations, helping them to transform their performance. His clients include the Diane Fossey uh, Gorilla Fund, Médecins Sans Frontières, uh, UNHCR, the U.S. Olympics, World Vision, and Greenpeace International, among others. He's also written six award-winning books on fundraising and social change. His most recent with Omar Mahmoud, the head of global knowledge at UNICEF International, is Change for Good, Behavioral Economics for a Better World. So Bernard, it's up to you. Let's take it here from here. Would you like me to pull up your slides or you want to go ahead and speak? No, okay. Before? I just want to say that I, that makes me sound like a much smarter person than I really am. Oh, oh you're, you I'm, are brilliant. I'm, you know I'm that. delighted to be here. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. And, I, and such a pleasure to connect across the miles with you in New York. You guys are having a very, very tough time. We're having a, we're having a tough time in the UK, but... Uh, but that this connection and the connection of other people coming in is is super important. Um, I had a thought actually, is just that you you said something there earlier. Should we think that you said that part of your purpose is to enable new thinking, which I think I've always uh, I love to tell the same jokes all the time. It's easier every time I see you, <laughs> you're saying new stuff. But I had, I had a thought earlier today, triggered by someone else, uh, which is about um, the story the 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 story of the virus. And um, I hear your president, I hear my prime minister, I hear lots of people talking about uh, we're in a war against the virus. And I want to say, I don't think this is a war story. This is a love story, you know? And and I, I always don't like, you know, it's part of reframing, what you and I call reframing. Yes. Stop talking about this being a war. The bug is just a bug. Like, the, <laughs> we're just a big bug. You know, we're yeah. just a big bug on the planet. Uh, the story wants to tell us not the story of um, 
there is heroism taking back, but it's heroism from a place of love. And we need more love now, I think. It sounds like corny, but but just thinking about what's going on now as a love story rather than a, a war story is, is part of your the new thinking we have to apply. The situation is what the situation is. How we think about it, how we respond to it rather than react to it is the thing that makes a difference. Anyway. No, I, I, I agree 100% with you. Um, that virtual summit I participated in, uh, the introduction you facilitated, one of the things I spoke about is being really, really critical for organizations that are um, either engaging um, you know, through social media with their supporters or virtual events. It's really conveying that sense of love. That's really what I was thinking, mm -hmm. speaking about is because right now we have an opportunity to come together, right? Um, we've, we typically are in our own little corners and it's sort of fundraisers versus donors. It's, you know, private sector versus public sector and so on and so forth. And we're all in this together, right? The, the, mm -hmm. the, the bug doesn't discriminate. So we're all in the same, effectively in the same place. And so we have an opportunity to reframe how we look at the world, how we work together. Um, and even though we're physically separated this technology is actually bringing us together in ways that we wouldn't otherwise see. I also yep. think the fact that you're seeing someone in their home um, and, 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 you know, we usually meet in, you know, I, last time I saw you was in a restaurant. I've seen you in conferences. And here we are in our homes getting to know each other in that way while we're working and playing and so on and so forth. So I think we're actually have, we have an opportunity to get closer to understand um, what we all need, how we can work together to move forward. And so we can break down some of those really artificial barriers that we've, that we've been working with. And I think this is a time for us to really show our love for each other mm -hmm. and, and, and bring that out. Because, I, I, you know, too much war, too much, too you know, much too, we have just too much, you know, we just, we have, we, it's us against this little bug. <laughs> we have to so love I it today. Okay. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. I, I think and, and I think the other thing is that the, uh, the kind of connecting to what we're talking about, behavioral economics, decision science, that, um, you know, everyone's talking about the big change that is happening in the, you know, either happening now, as you've described, person to person, or will happen, you know, when, what will be the new normal? Everyone's clear that the old normal isn't available. What will be the new normal? But I think what's interesting about decision science and behavioral economics is that that has already changed the way we are and the way we are. And most people just haven't noticed. Right. You know, it's, it's already changed. And, and I think some of the examples I want to share with you today are about how business has been using some of these techniques from psychology and from neurology for probably, certainly a decade, maybe even two decades. And people in the charity or the not-for-profit world or the social change world, however you want to describe it, need to up their game and use these techniques because this is, this is the new normal of communication. Behavioral economics, decision science is the new normal of, of communication. But lots of people haven't clocked that. No. Uh, what, what, what motivated you to motivate? What motivated mm -hmm. you to start studying this and, and, and uh, quite literally uh, get yourself in the subways of New York to do your primary uh, research and all that? I, I was kind of dreading you were going to. Well, I actually came out from <laughs> failure. Of course, it, as many things. You, you get into something because of a failure. So let me let me tell you my failure story, and then I'll try and turn it to make me look smart, which is really what you're supposed to do. <laughs> so I was doing a piece of work. I'm, I'm a big fan of the arts. I think you know that. I, I know love, that. I love the course. city. I love London because of, and one of the things I most miss is the chance to see theatre. Anyway, I was doing some work for an art centre. How about Edinburgh? Or, no? Edinburgh. Oh, am I showing Edinburgh as cancelled, but it will be available. Okay. Uh -huh. So. I was doing a piece of work for an art centre, advising them about fundraising. And I told them, okay, what we do, we should put a collection box and I'll design the collection box, use some clever clever um, uh, graphics and imaging and we'll put some money in it so that people think it's normal. And, and I tell you what, let's put it next to your big thing which says, your big uh, part of the wall which says, oh, we are funded by the Jim Smith and... Foundation and the Joan Jones Foundations and the, the Arts Council and the local authority. And people will be impressed and go, oh my God, this must be a worthwhile thing. So we placed the box there and uh, it did no money at all. And the customer was very unhappy, saying, I paid you some hundreds, thousands of pounds to design this clever thing and it doesn't work. And I, mm -hmm. I thought, why does it not work? That seems that seems logical to me. And there, there's the flaw in my thinking. It seemed logical to me that people would look at all those impressive donors 
and uh, and think, well, this must be a worthwhile thing. So then uh, I actually heard the story of Kitty Genovese. I don't know if you, is that a story you know about New York? No, I don't, but I know that's on your, can I pull it up? Yeah, please do. Sure, okay. So it's a terrible story. So in the midst of my depression, I was, uh, I was reading about Kitty Genovese, um, uh, a young woman uh, who was murdered in 1964. She was a bar worker in New York. She was coming home one night um, and she was attacked by a man, a guy called Winston Mosley. And he attacked her about half past three in the, in the night. So she drove, closed the bar, drove home, um, drove into a kind of courtyard, you know, a typical New York courtyard. And mm -hmm. the man attacked her and she shouted and lots of neighbours switched on the lights and then he managed to stop her shouting. The neighbours switched off the lights. So it's just right. the, the second slide there. Um, and this happened three times. Over the space of half an hour, three times, they reckon 37 people looked out of their apartments, heard something going on and decided not to do anything about it. Now, at the time, uh, yes. the yeah. New York Times, you know, portrayed this as being the shame of New York, the city which forgot its humanity. And uh, I know you're too young to remember this, Liz. Um, I, I almost as I, but you know, at the time there were a lot of murders in New York. I think there were um, 636 murders in New York a year at that time. So this wasn't, wasn't the murder was unusual. What was more unusual was, oh my God, 37 people who could have helped this woman in order to cries for help. Right. And some, a couple of psychologists said, well, actually, are people really that mean? And what they, they then went around and interviewed lots of the people in the apartment and discovered what they called the bystander effect, which was that everyone thought that someone else was doing something about it. Oh, everyone yes, thought that yes, someone else yes. was doing something about it. And in fact, it was the fact that there were so many people switching on the lights and going, Oh, she's much. She's further down the street, or um, it stopped for a minute. I guess someone dealt it, and bang! I exposed my. I suddenly realized. So what I realized was that by putting my donation box next to all these signs saying the Jim Jones Foundation and the Janet Jones Foundation, all the donors were saying, "You know what? They're all looking after the art center. I don't." Right, they're good. Go. Oh no, I no, stupid as stupid. So I ran back and said, let's two choices. Either you get rid of that big wall praising all your donors, or you need to move move the box. And what we did is we actually moved, first of all, the box and money went up. So that was interesting. And then eventually they tucked the wall away. Because of course that wall is there to impress those people. And they can go and find and look at their name. Um right. and that was like and so that that one of the key um, ideas in behavioral economics is that we're not logical. You know, it was logical. Oh, goodness, those impressive organizations are supporting them. They must be respectable. Therefore, I should donate. And, and what I was doing was saying, I realized that you had to say, no, no, really, this is up to you. You you need to have agency here. You need to, if you don't help, other people won't help. So uh, in terms of my fundraising work, that's a business. But how do you help donors feel that you know, they read about Yemen. They couldn't put Yemen on a map. They read about a million people starving. How many is a million people? They read about, we need 400,000 ventilators. How, 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 how many is that? I have no, I can't, I can't imagine those numbers. So how do you make things salient? I understand what it means. Mm -hmm. How do you give people agency, make them feel that they can do something? And, la and most importantly, how do you stop them feeling I'm a bystander? Somewhat, the government will sort this out or um, the foundation will sort this out or a corporation will sort this out and say, right. no, no, I, I need to sort this out. So so uh, my success <laughs> began in failure. But you know what, but Bernard, can I just tell you something? We all do that, right? Because you want to always show all your shiny donors. You want to, you know, showcase them because that's the thinking. That is the thinking. How, right? how, how clever, how clever am I? Like whether it's a donor or a customer. Yeah. yeah. So I think behavioral economics, um, what, what's interesting to me about it is that it, it, um, it says to us that people are not logical and you should stop asking them to be logical because most of the time, not always, we are not mm -hmm. logical. And we're not logical about very big things, about the person we end up being married or in a relationship with, the job we do, you know, how uh, 
when you ask most people how do you get into that job they don't have a well aged five i wanted to be a fire person and here i am a surgeon you know uh, you know people it's not a logical thing so that that's important and the, the kitty genovese learning is an interesting one i've got some other ones if that's helpful yeah, and, no and i know I, I when you started saying that i remember i do remember this I actually do remember this it's it you know you're absolutely right. Every because you're waiting for someone else to do it. <laughs> someone else has got it, right? You know. So, um, where where can we go next? So why don't you just give? Can you just can you just help us to kind of just get a sense for um, decision science in terms of just like in one sentence what it is? You've given us you've illustrated it for us with one sentence, and then we go into how it applies to people's okay. work and so on, and, and the way you've applied it. Two words in it science this is not opinion you know and i yes. the, one of the things i hate about fundraising is uh and lots of social change work is that you very often you hear anecdote you know a story which and i kind of want to say half a dozen anecdotes isn't a data set it's not a no. great thing, but it, you know but science is about you know we, we actually have a science there that we can bring in and decision how do we make choices it's not very complicated so so it's uh, the science the robust learning we have about how we make choices and and uh, we're now learning a huge amount about that from uh from three different areas one area is uh what's called um what's called evolutionary psych psychology so we all have hardwired into some choices we make uh, that came about from our you know the herd instinct if, if, if you've ever seen the you know a, a tv show about the great migration in 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 africa you see yeah. you know the the uh, oxes or whatever come up to the river and the one goes and if it gets across or they all go across you know and we do that in we stand in lines we sat maybe not in new york but we like standing in lines or in queues if we go to a street uh, uh um uh, a city we don't know and we walk up and down a, a line of restaurants we we'll go into the one that's full or the one that has yeah, a that's you know, right. you know, so we, exactly. are, we are paired animals now that's a great thing from evolutionary point of view because you look after each other you do what other people do um so that that that's hardwired into us that 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 a tendency to be and that sadly when i see panic buying you know it's really interesting me going around the supermarket and uh. I'm kind of going, I don't need toilet paper. I don't need toilet tissue. Yeah, I, I, mean, I, 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 I have to tell you, I was one of those people like, what are they doing? You know, watch yeah. that TV. And, and then at some point I started panicking. Yeah. So, oh, you didn't have yeah. to go and look. I mean, it's just yeah. it's very hard not to. Um, and it, it's not about, it's about that herd instinct, which is hardwired into, it has a useful, it's not, a, it's not an illogical thing. It's a useful thing to do, but, it has an unhappy consequences for example um in the panic buying it has good consequences too for example when um i took my niece to the fireworks you know we have big fireworks on november the 5th in the uk and i took her to the fireworks and um as you leave, leave the fireworks were free and as we left there was a charity a hospice collecting money and i gave my niece five pounds i gave her you know a, a five pound note she said no no no. i don't i don't want five pounds have you got any coins and i had some coins but i said the coins is less the coins is like two pounds three pounds whereas the note is more about she said no no but can you not hear pretty people putting money and people <laughs> putting money into buckets and she heard the noise and she wanted to put money in oh, does that make sense because yeah. money makes noise whereas five pounds or ten pounds doesn't make noise and right. so that and that was right as we left the queue i didn't want to oh my god people will think i didn't i ended up i said okay let me put money in because i didn't want to put nothing if i put the note in it wouldn't make a noise and i would have, <laughs> i would have failed with the crowd you know yeah so, exactly. these are so in one sense so silly but they have a they have an evolutionary dimension to them um the other thing is we now know some stuff about how our you know what happens in our brains when we commit an altruistic act you know we know that um what areas of our brains are lit up what 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 chemicals flow through us oxytocin you know, right. we know some chemicals which turn on and if you know liz that um eye contact when when i'm when a baby's born one of the first things it does you probably don't remember this either but um as a baby what if i think that a baby does it's to look at its mother's eyes you know and the mother's yeah. looking you know 
and then very often for many babies not all babies you're breastfed right and what happens is you get your mother looks at you and breastfeeds you and you get through your mother's milk oxytocin you get yeah. that you get that drug you get, right. your mother is your first dealer right <laughs> it's the first <laughs> dealer in your life uh, and so ever after when we look in other people's eyes we get a little rush of oxytocin not as much as we get from our mothers right you know, and, and when we're with a, a new lover or a new partner i'm sure you've been out for dinner I know you are a very loving woman, but you know, if you're out to dinner and you've been in a relationship for a while, you don't have to talk. Right. You can read the newspaper, you can play the phone. Two people who are in love for the first time are going, Oh my god, they're looking they're at each other. Staring each other's eyes. eyes. Oh, yeah. Like, they're getting oxygen. These these two people are drunk to the eyeballs. Um, yeah. so there's a so there's the evolutionary psychology, the stuff that's hardwired, there's the mm -hmm. stuff that's just to do with the drugs that are going through us. And then the last thing is, is this, this is called behavioral economics, which is where we we get a stimulus and we respond in a rational way. So those three three bodies of knowledge have combined into decision science. Okay. That was slightly more than one sentence, but um, that's okay. <laughs> You've given us an overview. So so what does it mean for folks? Like what 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 are the implications for those of us who are right now trying to think about how to restart our fundraising or how we can engage with our customers better or you know even like for for people who are out of work and are, are now trying to find new work or um mm -hmm. or just trying to just trying to find a sense of how to move forward you know what well, that, okay no that, that's a good example. let me um let me uh, show you another slide i think the next okay, slide the next one yeah uh, yeah which is more about the company so, so like <laughs> you, you got a new job as head of Head of selling Mars bars, you know? Right. Type 2 diabetes in a convenient package, as I sometimes call it. Yeah. So how would you, so when, you, when I give people that quiz in my sessions, I say, people shout out, oh, get George Clooney, Clooney to eat one, or, you know, <laughs> get Madonna to eat, depending on who your preference is, or make them, uh, you know, make it a unique limited edition, or put, uh, make it the largest Mars bar in the world, or the smallest, blah blah. blah. All of which the Mars company have thought of well, and mm -hmm. has done. But the the single thing which changed Mars's sales didn't come from any of those clever marketing ideas. If you want to change to the next slide, sure. Oh, uh, oh, I meant sorry, I meant that slide. Anyway, it came from no click back a bit. Sorry, it came from. Um, when the Mars, when the Mars Pathfinder landed on Mars, the world Mars was available to people. <laughs> yeah, and so they sold more Mars bars. Now people go off and say, "Well, okay, I'm not trying to sell Mars bars. Let me move you on to the next slide, then." Yes. Which is about so the word Mars that wouldn't work in fundraising, but if you take the the slide away from that, the image away, and click to the next slide. Uh, interestingly, uh, we did some work, and it was backed up by um, this guy Adam Alter in his book *Drunk Tank Pink*. That across seven hurricane appeals globally in the Red Cross and Red Crescent, most donations came from people whose names shared the hurricane's initial thing. So, for Hurricane Mitch, more people called Mary or Marty or Marion gave money to that cause. That's, so, wow. That's that's insane. It's like the Mars yeah. bar thing. It's insane. Uh, well, right. that is, it's called the cocktail party effect. Guys. You, right. you and I are so often at many cocktail parties in Rome, Berlin, whatever. We're talking blah, 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 blah. We tune out to everything else until we hear our name, until you hear the word Liz. Right. And you tune out of the conversation yeah. and you listen to what people are saying. Our name is a very powerful draw to us. Right. Um, and so including people's names... Um, in an appeal, or if you're writing a resume out to a new, you know, I sadly I'm getting huge numbers of people saying, "Dear sir, you know, I saw your website," and just saying, "Dear Bernard," or the fact that I know you like to be called Liz rather right. than Elizabeth. Yeah, that, that's how I know. If anyone writes to me, "Dear Elizabeth," I know they don't know me. Or, um, or, it, or you know, it's your mother criticizing you to get. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, those are your own issues, right? Okay. <laughs> I mean, it's awesome. Okay. That's but that, insane, but, people yeah. like using people's, you know, and in some cases, if I go into the bank, you know, I went to the bank today, 
see if I had any money left. Uh, and if the bank said, oh, hi, Bernie, how are you doing? I'm saying, hi, I'm in the bank here. I'm Mr. Ross in the bank. So it's not that yeah. you're who's, you know, choosing the format, but the idea of um, catching people's attention um, by using the, you know, the their name and the correct form of the name uh, as a way of engaging them in, in any message. I, I, I agree so much with you on that because, I mean, I, I, I actually shared this, I think, or last week um, with students. I'm like, you know, if you're writing, if you're writing a grant application, you're writing to whoever, it doesn't, it takes you two seconds to do the research to figure out who the person is that you're trying to find uh, and or, or who, who, who the, the, the recipient would be because it really makes a big difference because you don't want to be the person writing the dear sir or madam letter. That's yeah. just, you know, you just don't I, want to do that. Not, not well, this stage when information's so names properly. I mean, these are, you know, but we, fabulous thing is we live in a in a time when, you know, I, I can sit on the, the last time I sat on the tube in, or the underground in London, sadly, that's my kind of, I had five different kinds of Spanish. I had Mexican Spanish, I had Spanish Spanish, you know, and I, you know, so the names are now, not as simple as Smith or Jones or Ross, and just spelling people's names properly. You must get 20 different versions of not a very complicated name. Right. I, but get I it do. wrong. Get yeah. it wrong. Actually, flick on to the next slide, Liz. That might be interesting. I think it, there's my, okay, July the 4th. That I just put them in the wrong order. Okay, that's uh, all right. That's just, and flick on to the next one. Sorry, thank you for being my. Uh, so you, you probably know that the poor Corona beer people have yeah. lost massive sales. So I went in. I went. This says something sad to me. I was in the supermarket the other day looking for some beer to buy. The mm -hmm. only beer that was still on the shelf. The corona. <laughs> corona beer. So yeah. I, I really, truly, I well, I came up with a case of this, um, which was not a. It's not the most popular beer, but anyway. But that's extraordinary, but it's kind of the, the positive Mars effect, the negative corona effect. So that that, that idea of a name or a word um is important. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. I agree with you. Do you want so me to that, go to the next slide? Or do you or that's I flick on to a couple more slides? I've got some other nice little but flick through. So flick past that. Uh that's just a slide. If you click on it. You've mentioned some of the agencies that you lot of big agency charities now. You this this stuff is being used by most of the big companies, but I'm really pleased to see lots of big charities now using these techniques. Flick on to the next one, and that's just some stuff about the uh, the three areas which combine to decide in science. The, uh, every, Liz, I'll send you a handout about all this stuff, but I, okay. people might want notes. I'll send you some stuff about this, sure. Uh, but evolutionary psychology, neuroscience, behavior, and Important to say the science, this is back ended by two. Oh, thank goodness that the patriarchy still has a use. Middle aged, <laughs> older white men still have a use. You're, you're, st you're still okay, Bernard. I'm on the okay. <laughs> but the uh, fantastic guy, Daniel Kahneman on the left and Richard Thaler on the yeah. right, both won the Nobel yep. Prize about 10 years apart for this body of work. Uh, Kahneman, especially important, the ni nice guy on the right, he, um, on the guy's guy on the left, um, and he, um, Interestingly, he won the Nobel Prize for Economics, and he is not an economist. He's a psychologist. Can you imagine how pissed off wow. the world's economists wow. were that a non-economist <laughs> won the Nobel Prize for Economics? That's yeah. Very so that's where the science comes from. Go, Pat, go to the next slide. Uh, that's just about the gratitude. The next slide, maybe. And Kahneman's big idea is not very complicated. It's just that we have we have two ways of making decisions. Uh, and we like to think that system two, the logical, explicit, slow, analytical, rule-based way, is the way that's in charge. That you know, that's what makes us find partners, buy houses, um, take jobs, buy buy products. His evidence suggests that of the twenty-seven thousand decisions we make a day, it's mostly system one. Implicit, fast, intuitive, instinctive, emotional, unconscious. Um, you know, it's the difference between. I'm speaking English now. So some people, I'm. I have a Scottish accent. For those of you who are native speakers of English, you may be struggling to understand my my English. But I'm not thinking about the words. You know, no. so I'm speaking from system one. When I speak Spanish, my Spanish is terrible. You know, I go into 
I'm in Spain. Thank goodness they have the word bar. It's the same word, so I'm in a bar. I go in and I got to the bar tender. I thought, oh my God, I must speak Spanish. So I need to think the first person of the singular word to want. And you conjugate and all that. Yeah. So that's Kiero. And I say Kiero, and the barman says, okay, tell me what, you, what, what is it, you Kiero? And I'm saying, oh my God, is it? And I know the Spanish word for beer is cerveza, but is it yeah. una cerveza or un cerveza? Is it masculine or feminine? Because we don't have masculine feminine. Oh my God. So instead I will say unyar cerveza. Right. Favor. Right. And the Spanish bar person will say, listen, shall we just speak English? It would be much easier. <laughs> that's, that's my system too in language. Yeah. Okay. Uh, got another night. Just flip to the next nice example. And there's a uh, Flick past that, yeah. Uh, how we think and everything. So click on the movie here. And I just want people to look at this. And as people look at the movie, they will probably instantly see the tube train either leaving the station or entering the station. Oh, wow. And now I want you to do -do 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 -do, tell the train to go the other way. And you see it what happened? Just, it, it didn't go the other way. No, 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 no. It's in all it is is your system one, first of all, tells you it's going one way. And then your system, when I kick in your system two brain and say, right. make it go the other way, you go, what's the data that's telling me that? So what very often happens is system one makes a decision, and then right. sometimes system two comes in. Hang on a minute, is this is this a good idea? This thing you want to do? to marry this person or to buy this house or to take this job have a think about it so that the relationship is that system one is our fast quick way to make decisions mm -hmm. um it's like again if you flick to the next slide sure. then i think that's going to drive you crazy the, we have a number of little decisions we have a number of things in our brains called heuristics. These heuristics yeah. are quick rules that we have to make decisions. Right. And it's a bit like you can probably see this. It's a very English site of, you know, clearly you, the, the person who designed this did, meant you to bicycle between the gates and then move on and bicycle on. And most people just, oh, around it. go around it. And and that's what our brain does. So, yeah, I know I should do the right thing, but you know what I'm going to And those heuristics and the... The bystander effect is a heuristic. The um, the cocktail party effect is a heuristic. We, we maybe have as many as 147 of these heuristics. Quick rules that we use to make decisions. Right. And sometimes they are helpful and sometimes they're not. Right. Uh, that's right. There's a good reason for that. The next slide and then I'll stop talking for a minute. That's no, okay. Which is that the reason that, and it, it's an evolutionary reason, so our brain is only 2% of our total weight, but it uses 20% of theirs. So the reason we have these heuristics mm -hmm. is to save energy. You know, our, our our brains are very clever about thinking. I don't want to think too much about, you know, because if you thought every day about, maybe it's a gendered comment, you know, if I tried to think every day about what should I wear, it would take me a long time. Whereas if I just go, oh my goodness, there's a blue shirt. I think I'll wear that. Life is much easier. I don't, I don't need to think too much about it. And we make lots of choice, lots of those 27 choices we make using these heuristics to mm -hmm. save energy. It, it's to do with uh, reducing what's called cognitive load. That's right. We just don't want to think too much about stuff. Okay. Yeah, no, I, that makes sense. I, I don't want to think about too too hard about stuff myself. <laughs> no. And I think yeah. you know, I was also asking, you asked me a question about people, um, you know, looking for jobs and stuff like that, to understand that, you know your your resume uh, should be as sort as you can make it. You know, there's no you know a five page resume. People are not going to read it. You know, no. you you got me at you got me at paragraph one. Right. Simple hint for people as well about resumes. I, 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 it is a bad thing from a diversity point of view. But it, if you put your resume on eighty gram paper, typical paper like that, mm -hmm. uh, and you print the same resume on 150 gram you know just thicker heavier paper sure people will say about the same we, we use pounds in america by the okay. way okay okay <laughs> we're still we're still in the 19th century i know um yeah <laughs> the, uh, the uh the heavier people will judge the resume printed on the heavier paper the candidate as being 
more able, more competent. That that's terrible in one right. sense. It destroys uh, lots of principles about diversity and equality and stuff. But if you want to get your resume recognised, send it in. If you, you know, send it by email, but maybe back it up by mailing it on nice paper. Right. You know, paper and uh, you go into a restaurant. You'll notice that uh, you and I have eaten in some very, very, very nice restaurants. Yeah, it's and, true. Uh, you know, I, and I think I paid, did I? <laughs> I think of course. I, of I course seem to paid. remember that as being the dumb thing, but you know, I, a nice <laughs> restaurant will have heavy cutlery. You know? But you know, because the reason is because you you pick my brain during the dinners. That's why. <laughs> Something like that, but the the heavy cutlery is, and you know, people report when they go for a meal, if the um the cutlery is heavy, they will report the meal in general as being more worthwhile. I mean, that yeah. it's called sensory transfer that we make a presumption about, you know, um, uh, the quality of something from another quality. In the same right. way, as you think attractive people are tend to get judged of being smarter when sure they're not always but we make that judgment so the, these are all heuristics which can and they're almost they're a bit like the bug you know they're just neutral they don't they inhabit the world we can use them for good or ill okay um mm -hmm. i have a question from the audience oh, if cool. i can just, just add it so they're friends marcelo eric 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 yeah Marcelo. Yes. From Argentina. Marcelo. So he's, he's complaining he about my Spanish, probably. Is that true? <laughs> he said, "Can you talk about mass behavior and the COVID-like toilet paper, or why government, why government um, had, why there were, just, why government delayed with self-isolation?" Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think the toilet paper. I didn't know where the toilet paper thing came from. Yeah, it was so bizarre. I saw these yeah. people like in Walmart, all over the place. I mean, I, I'm, just all hand, the I'm just hand gel. I got hand gel because toilet paper, I didn't know, were people suddenly eating more vegetables? I didn't, what, what, uh, <laughs> but but it, 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 to me, it connects to salience. That is, and, and our experience that, you know, when you heard that toilet paper was short or toilet tissue was short, it became, at the, it's almost like the Mars bar thing. You, I, I, I mean, I almost went and had to check whether there was toilet paper. But normally speaking, I wouldn't go and check. I, was we buy so little toilet paper that I did? But I would. You would go and check, and you would see it was empty. You know, it was interesting. So, Ber so Bernard, you know, say again. Sorry, I want to share something with you on that. I okay. actually, I went to the supermarket. I walked to the different places in my neighborhood. And I couldn't find any. So I happened to know the, the cell phone number of my supermarket manager. So I texted him to find out. And he told me, if you show up Saturday morning at 7.30, we get a, we get a whole shipment in at that point. So I was there at like 7, and I was waiting. And then when they got there, even though they came in at 7.30, I had to wait another like 40 minutes to get it. And like literally, I was standing right in the aisle to get it. And I like practically grabbed it out of the guy's hands. So I became mm -hmm. one of those people. I you think know, and I got one you know? It's a combination of salience. You're made aware of it, and it, it, salience is very interesting because we we become worried about things which we read. About. Uh, again, go back to the terrible COVID thing. Uh, uh, as I read my Twitter stream, I tend to see more stories saying, "My dad passed today. Uh, yeah. I lost my son. I lost my brother, or I, I've personally lost a couple of friends." Um, now, most people recover. Even most people who get this evil, and even most people who get it badly, recover. Mm -hmm. You know that the death rate is a terrible death rate of one or two percent, but it is one or two percent. So why are we so frightened of this thing? And the answer is salience. We don't, you know, it's a bit like uh, it's a bit like playing the lottery. And you know, um, I, I don't want the chance down in the U.S., but in the U.K., playing the lottery are 120 million to one, Yeah. okay? There is more yeah, chance of being hit by lightning twice in a week than there is of winning the lottery. You better go into a, a, you know, what we call a bookie, a, you know, like a betting shop and saying, I'd like to put five pounds to bet that I will be hit by lightning twice in this week. 
who are more <laughs> likely to win that bet. So why do people, sensible, intellectual people, play the lottery when it's a meaningless thing? Because you never hear about the losers. You only ever hear about the winners. Right. Does that make That's sense? True. Yeah, that makes sense. Oh, my God. That could be me. Why do we, we go on, you know, hardly more people are killed by shopping trolleys than by shark attacks. Why are we terrified of shark attacks? Because of Jaws. Because of Jaws, <laughs> which is a film. That's not really true. Yeah. Um, so that's salient. You know, things get brought to our mind by um, by the regular media, by social media. And because they're in our minds, we, we can't, you know, if I say to you, don't think of an elephant. That's exactly what I'm thinking. That's what you think of. <laughs> yeah. Um, it also elephant. holds an, an embedded command, but the... So that's a great question for Marcelo. And, um, you know, I think the, uh, you know, the herd instinct has a potential to be negative, which is the uh, crazy buying. And of course, that excludes many poor people who don't have the money to go and buy. You know, they only have the money to buy today's shopping or tomorrow's shopping or the sweet shopping. But it also has a good thing about, uh, you know, they made a, I live in a little town called Lewis, um, and we have 17,000 people in our town. And I went around with some colleagues and put like posters up saying, putting posters up saying, you know, volunteer to help. We had 4,000 volunteers offering to help. Hardly okay. anyone wanted help. And there were right. lots of people aged over 70 saying, just because I'm over 70 doesn't mean I can't help. You know? <laughs> so don't, don't, don't ask me to stay. So we have that's beautiful you know we, we yeah. did a national scheme in the uk Six hundred thousand people out of a population of of um 60 million signed up to help them you know huge number of people that people are volunteering to help that that's good herd instinct yeah you, you, you can't have good without the bad right you know Andre Malraux said take away my devils and you take away my angels too they yep. you know the, the the head instinct is good and bad. What we need to be doing is more looking for good opportunities to to pay it forward, uh, to, to volunteer, to encourage others. You know, and our, we should be trying to fill our Twitter streams with, you know, stories of good things that happened. You know, right? Yeah, um, yeah. I no, I I agree with you. So so another, Marcella has another question, and I'll ask mine. He says, optimistic bias on governments. That's okay. Yes, yeah. yeah, so I think government. Yeah. So again, Marcelo knows his knows his decision science. I think um, <laughs> we tend to we tend to be focused on the future and focused on positive outcomes. Uh, you know, uh, I'm sure you must have had friends in the past to say after a lifetime of disastrous love affairs, to saying, "But this time is different." This yeah, time, sure. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, really, really, really. really? Um, you know, we have that's and that's maybe the thing that the crazy thing that drives us to explore and to take chances and to be entrepreneurs like you. Um, okay. but government, it's very dangerous for the governments to be optimistic. I, you know, I, uh, I, I can't talk about your government, I can talk about my government and say, I, I think my government was way too optimistic about the ability of our health system to deal with the scale of the challenge, you know. Right. Um, COVID was not a meteorite striking the earth. Nobody knew. Right. It was not right. a, uh, an act of terrorism like the Twin Towers. Right. It, 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 you just had to read the newspapers uh, mm -hmm. or, or, or read the science. And I think that's what I hired my government to do, to, to read the newspapers three months ago and to make plans. And sadly, I do think my government and, may, you know, Maybe the Germans, I don't know, the Germans seem to be doing a pretty good job of keeping the uh, Singaporeans, yes. the Chinese, and that's very challenging if you think about uh, what a... Uh, you know, challenging. You know, huge, you know, and if you ask most people in this circumstance, would you give up your civil liberties to be safe? That's a tough call. Some people would say yes, you know. Some, some people would say yes. But... You know, they dealt with it because they took it seriously. Yeah. Uh, and I, I don't know that we, that optimism bias is something we need to be aware of in ourselves, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and not be unnecessarily uncomfortable. But governments, for sure, for sure. 
Sure. So, so no, I, I agree with you. So how, he said, thank you, Bernard. <laughs> You're yes. welcome. So, so how do we, like, when we, if we think about folks who are right now really freaking out in their organizations, um, you know, there's some organizations that are shut down uh, through this. There's some organizations that are just kind of holding on. I know, you know, from different people I teach, the different forms I've been involved in, there are a lot of organizations that are really in a lot of trouble right mm -hmm. now. Let's say they're, they, they're, a lot of their fundraising was related to events that were canceled or or their funders who've, who've pulled their pledges, whatever it may be. How organizations who are facing this crisis right now, which I also think is also an opportunity, how, how can we help them to be able to apply this in a way that um, can help them to, to, to kind of reboot um, and to well, I, I, let's distinguish this between. Uh, I, I, I think. It all today, uh, yeah, <laughs> I think I'm now. I'm sure you would agree with this. I think there's two issues at work here. One is that the basic principles of good fundraising are still the same. Uh, what decision science can do is add some new techniques, but you know that fundamental belief that people want to be yeah. altruistic and want to be generous. That that you know that is. That's hardwired into us, it, it, you know, to, yes. to give blood, to uh, to help people. If you don't think someone else is going to help them, you know, it's, the, the interesting thing about the Kitty Genovese story is they repeated a number of experiments, those scientists expect some experiments, where instead of having, and they, they arranged for, say, a student to fall over in the corridor and go, ow, ow, as mm -hmm. though they'd broken their leg. And, that, and several times for there to be maybe 20 students there, or on occasion for there to be one student there. Every single time there was one student there, the one student stepped forward to help. Every time there was 20 of them, there was kind of a, oh, uh, oh I'm on my way, she, you know, I'm busy, she'll help, blah, 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 you know. The, so speak to your donors as though they are one person and that one person has agency, you know. Use their name, of course. Yes. Um, I think I've just had a conversation today uh, with, uh, I'm helping a zoo in Edinburgh uh, to, um, to help raise money. And they've got some great things. They've got um, a webcam, they've got a webcam. You can go in and see the penguins being fed. And I said, okay, every time you're feeding the, the, the penguins, please go and hold a sign up saying, thank you for giving us the money to feed the penguin. Rocky the rock copper says that, you know, say Rocky the rock rock copper says thank you. And then point to Rocky, you know, make, make people feel that they have agency. Um, yeah. Beautiful thing I heard from Tom Ahern, great, a great fan of Tom Ahern the other day was, mm -hmm. don't thank me for my gift. Thank me for being me. Yeah. Don't thank me for giving you 50 dollars. You know, thank you for your 50 dollars. Thank you for being a loyal supporter of the opera. I love that. For thank you for donating to the making sure that poor people in this town don't go without yeah. in the, through the food bank. You know, thank me for what I did, my, my sense of identity, and so that's one thing. Secondly, appeal to the right sense of identity. As so, for example, I do a lot of work with food banks. I'm doing a lot of work with food banks just now, which is an important thing. Of course. So. I, I always go to uh, buy fresh vegetable, organic fresh vegetables, and you know, blah. and of course, I was buying all the wrong thing. And then my local food bank said, "Bernard, thank you so much for your help. You know, designing lots of clever things in the supermarket. Can we just show you the things we want?" And they gave me a thing said, "Tin vegetables." And I said, "Where are tin vegetables in the supermarket? I don't, I don't go there. I buy fresh asparagus, or you know, because that's I'm so middle class, you know." Um, and they say, well, but tin vegetables are much more useful because right. they store for a long time. Um, right. I've gone by tampons the other day. I've never bought a tampon in my life. I don't have periods. I've never had periods. I understand that some people do. It, right. but I'd go and try and find the tampon. Then there's all kinds of tampons. Well, again, but you know, if I, because food bank, you know, food banks need to look after. Other needs, whatever that's classified as, you know. But yeah, I don't know. So, so talk to me as a donor. Sorry, talk to me as a person who happens to have the ability to donate. Um, 
tell me what I can do and, and tell me what you'd like me to do. And don't, don't be afraid to say, Bernard, I know you've never, never bought tampons before. Just go to the, you know, and buy any packet. It doesn't matter. Or the, you know, blah, blah, blah. Tell me what you want me to do. Yeah. Thank you for doing it. Hold me up a sign saying, you know, again, the, the zoo in Edinburgh is going to do a random thing, but they're going to hold up random things saying, thank you, Bernard, for your gift. You know, they're not, they're not going to, it's not that you have to put in a hundred dollars or more. It's going to be, so you're going to watch it to see if your name maybe comes up, you know, if you've made a donation. So, uh, you know, that's about the people to people bit. Um, no, I, I agree with you. Can I stop sharing this so we can, cause I can't look at you. I'm looking at your, at your presentation. I'm not looking at you. Sure, sure, sure. Okay. So let me just stop sharing it for now. And I sure. want to, I want to go back to, to something that you mentioned that I think is really, really important. Um, and it's fundamental, especially for, for sort of newer um, uh, uh, fundraisers and even a refresher for, for those who've been around. I think sometimes we forget why people give. Yeah. Right. And so I think we feel like I remember I, I remember at some point I worked for an organization and um, one of the people who who's who's or let me put it this way, he he ran a, a group of a, a department that we that we raised money for. Right. It was one of the departments mm -hmm. we raised money for. Mm -hmm. And he's like, oh, here are the professional beggars. They're coming. The professional beggars are coming. So, and I said, that's and everyone. They all laughed. The rest of everybody else laughed. And I said, that's not that's not funny. That's not mm -hmm. what this is about. We're not getting. We're not begging people for money to get you your sports program or whatever or to to fund what you're doing. We're actually helping, um, you know, our donors. That I was my donors from the U.S. to fulfill something that's that's significant for them. And in fact, I had them meet one of my U.S. donors, and she explained like why she was in, why she did this, why she gave so generously, she and her husband even to travel to 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 uh, South Africa with me to mm. visit, and it was really that this was something that was meaningful for them and it created meaning for them in their lives. And we, I think yeah. that we forget that, right? That we're helping to facilitate something that's important in someone's life and ultimately, um, you know, helping them to, to, to be that person that they want to be, to fulfill that, that human humanity within themselves. Mm -hmm. Right. I think mm -hmm. that, so like, even if we talk about technology, we talk about all these different things really fundamentally comes to under now into understanding that we are about love. Like going back to your original point, we are very loving and, at, at our core. And that we're hardwired to do it. You know, the, the little diagram we flashed past earlier of like neuroimaging altruism, that we know right. that, you know, the part of our, when we perform an altruistic act, it lights up the same part of our brain as if we receive an altruistic act. So if someone right. helps you up the stairs or says you i found your wallet in the street here it is it lights up the same bit of our brain as if we do that you know it's a kind of interesting mirror neuron thing um and it, it releases those drugs it releases endorphins it, you know it, I, I don't want to reduce us just to a, a drugged on gratitude or whatever drugged on generosity but you know but there are neurological things it's not just it's not just an airy fairy spiritual thing. It's a it's a real part of what we do. I think what's interesting, Liz, going back to I saw you smiling about tampons because that <laughs> is this because it's very interesting to me to go in, I'm completely out of my comfort zone. Sure. But I think that's important then when we talk. See, it's really easy for me to go to the supermarket and think, okay, you know, what do people need to eat? Canned food or fish or blah blah, and I buy that. Or it's easy for me to see. Uh, TV pictures of um, nurses going to work without masks and making gifts. I'm doing a lot of work just now with, as you mentioned, with Doctors Without Borders and um, uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, the, the same organisation. Um, where is Yemen? Where you know Yemen has disappeared. It wasn't very big ever on our screens, but right. it has sure is it. And if you said to most people, "Can you put Yemen on a map?" They couldn't do it. Yeah. What's a refugee camp like? You know, and, and if you, I think you've been to refugee camps. I, you know, the smell is the thing that distinguishes you. You know, you can't. For you and I, washing hands, um, using hand gel, is. I'm a, it, I'm a germaphobe, so it's, it's a privilege. <laughs> you know, you live in a refugee camp. You, the water that you drink, the water there is, you don't. You don't, we, you know, personal hygiene is very hard to maintain. You know, you've heard of soap. 
You've never yeah. had a man jail. Right. How do we as people who care for more than just our local tribe? And that to me, the human the what the reason why I'm delighted to be connected to you even across two of the wealthiest cities. You know, I mean, we are we are in both in relative privilege. Yeah. Absolutely, you know. Sure. Uh, but how do we connect people to what's happening in Yemen? What is going to happen in many countries? I know that you and I both love Africa. Um, you know, I, I think I, I heard today that there are in the Democratic Republic of Congo, there are four respirators mm -hmm. in a country of five and a half million people. There are four. You know, oh. what? Yeah. You know, um, and at the same time as. And, and you know, and our government. So I'm making a, maybe a political point now, but your government and my government have the money to sort stuff out. They have the army to sort stuff out. They have the tax base to sort stuff out. That's not true in many of those countries. And yeah. a lot of my energy is going towards trying to bifurcate, if you like, do what I can locally for the food bank. Uh, for my neighbours, blah, 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 but also to think about, and you know, I'd love people listening in to just try and keep that kind of bifurcation going about, you know, caring, care globally. Clear, care. And I, no, and I, 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 I agree with you 100% um, that we do need to think that way, right? Especially because, believe it or not, this is this, this COVID uh, slash Corona, COVID-19 slash Corona, is you not is you not uniting us as people because nobody is exempt right nobody nobody you know we all breathe we all you know so so i think th that's one thing but i and i and i agree that people should be willing to look beyond their their own you know tribe mm -hmm. their, their small community and really understand that we're all in it together and and and, and we need to really sort of solve this together but mm -hmm. at the same time what i think is also interesting is um and i you know me i always talk about I, I think about things from the vantage point of someone from Africa, um, as someone who came from Uganda, one of the things that we also have to recognize is there are a lot of African countries that have knowledge mm -hmm. and experience that's valuable to the rest of us. And we need to recognize that and we need to see the value because if you've dealt with Ebola, mm -hmm. okay, this is nothing. Yeah, <laughs> this is sure. nothing, right? Which oh, DRC sure. has dealt with Ebola several times over. In fact, they had an outbreak. And so I want to say, September. Um, so yeah. you know, even in Western Uganda, there's been an outbreak there at, in, the, in the past. There have there has been an outbreak of Ebola. You had it in West Africa and Liberia. In fact, the former Liberian president, Ellis Johnson Sirleaf, wrote, she penned a piece, and I think she's even given talks, um, sort of sharing her experience having to deal with that, right? And yeah. so I think it's important for us to think about how we help people in, in other communities and other countries um, and especially those countries that don't have the resources, but also respect. And learn from them. No, learn exactly. from them as well, exactly. because, because they they know. And so in Uganda, the government shut down immediately the borders because they were they knew. And Uganda is the, is the it seems to be the, I think it's known as the the most welcoming country in the world, right? And we basically mm. welcome everybody. So so we're it was particularly at risk. But you know, they definitely went into the lockdown right away and 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 even screening through the airports and stuff. They're already doing that. So I remember when I went to Uganda in December, you know, you had to go through like they had to check your temperature and all kinds of different things yeah. to get in. So they already had a lot of these things implemented before because yeah. they're great. So what can yeah. we learn from them instead of just saying, well, you know, we're here, so we show them or we need to give to them and, and so on and so forth. Well, it's an exchange, isn't it? I mean, we, we've got money in kit. Can you share some of how you... Uh, and there have been some great experiences of how countries have done that's that would be a lovely thing for you to do in one of these broadcasts is to connect to one of your your colleagues whatever about how you know how have people managed the uh, the social management of that the social isolation and that you know and the stories we're hearing now about people losing loved ones uh, and not being able to see them or to touch them well that's you know much scarier when you're dealing with ebola yeah because ebola you don't even like no, no. Yeah. Um, it's a whole, that's yeah, a whole different really, level. That's a that's a terrific thought. That's very good for us. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah so, it's okay. I mean, so hopefully, you know, folks, so hopefully that we'll be able to see that too, right? That there's value coming out of out of the, the global south, you know, in terms of, of, of best practices and stuff around this. And um, you know, and, and I and I think that let me just see, someone said, okay, so Christy Lockhart just wrote, she says, 
we need to learn a way do we, we need to learn in a way that supports and not exploits local voices. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then uh, Clementia Osa, who is in, she, she's, I met her in December in Kenya. Um, mm -hmm. she, she said, thank you. Thank you for recognizing that Africa has got knowledge and skills that should be utilized and respected, respected even as altruistic acts are, not, are done. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, you and I know also from time yeah. in Kenya that, uh, you know, in PESA, you know, so, you know, if you're looking at mobile phone fundraising, poof, Kenya is way ahead of your country and my country. It's just uh, oh, every no, everyone, everywhere. They, I mean, all worldwide. Um, yeah. The other thing that's interesting about in PESA, even though uh, um, you know we speak about it in, the, in the context of fundraising, um, you know, one of the things I've been challenged with is when I go to the supermarket or go to my my pharmacy, when I put my credit card in the reader thing to pay, I don't want to touch the buttons. I don't even want to put my credit card in, right? I don't even deal with that. And basically, Kenya has has switched primarily to M-Pesa for all transactions, so no more cash. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm sure that's other places that they've, that, that they've done that where they have it. So you're not even touching money because touch money mm -hmm. is really, really disgusting. But then at least you're not even having to touch the readers and all that stuff. Because I'm like, yeah. I tell them, I'm like, please touch it, you know, ask the cashier to do it. So they're even doing things like that. Those are some best practices so that you kind of stop mm -hmm. the spread a little bit, right? Because, you know, I, I was at my pharmacy and, and, and I told the young man, I said, look, I don't want to touch the button. He goes, oh, no, but I sanitize it every few minutes. I'm like, well, how about in between the few minutes? Like, you know, so how many of us go through in those few minutes between okay. what you said, it's like, right? Knowing how I am. So um, so I think it's really interesting that, no, that, think that, and that there is more awareness of that thing, I, I think now. And you've been a great, fantastic advocate. As as, as Christy, I know Christy from the yeah. she did some great work with a big, uh, big African NGO. Uh, I think there's lots of interesting stuff coming out of Africa and out of Asia. You know, that, that balance of power has changed we need to i don't even know i was gonna say we need to get over it i don't know we need to get over it it's just true you don't need to get over it it's just true uh but to be open to some of the the new you know to learn from china about dealing with uh COVID, to learn from kenya about uh cashless payments you know right we, we need to be and and uh, things like this that you're doing um uh, you know, I think are a great way to make to, to to highlight some of those issues to bring you know international entrepreneurs into into the room. Um, right. No. I, no. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I and I so I think I think I, like I said to you when we're speaking over the phone. I I just feel like this is this is a time of great opportunity. It's time where you're going to see a lot of innovation happen, um, and unfortunately, also going to see a lot of the, the we're going to see retraction right um, at the same time. But I think that. Um, I'm really excited to see what people are going to come up with, um, and with some of the medical advances that are coming to come outside, come out of all of the research that's being conducted, and even the fast tracking. Like, how do you mm. fast track all of this? Um, I think is is pretty exciting to see, um, and I think, you know, now is the time I think for nonprofits to think about how, um, even even businesses, how they can really make themselves much more relevant uh, because. Mm. What made you relevant in the past? Like it's kind of like PC, P, well, BC before COVID, and then now we're living. Okay, during, yeah. right? Yeah, I know, not the other one. Um, I, I, what you were doing then is going to have to change, and I think we we touched upon this. I mean, the fundamentals are fundamentals, but I think in terms of getting mind share, in terms of um, of of how folks will remember you during this time, because I think that. If you go straight to making asks, right, and just focus on making asks right now, it's not the way to do it. I think no. you just need to be humane at the very beginning. But the very, at the very least, find out how your donors are. How are your supporters? Yeah, How's begin by that? begin by being yeah. concerned about them. And also, I mean, interesting yeah. to me. I, again, we're back to this. You know, there are some tricksy ways to do things in decision sites. And let me, I will make sure that I give some of your listeners sure. access to some tears. But just think of, I mean, I like like me, you must be getting my inbox is full of um companies and charities saying, um a place where I bought a, a pair of trousers, a pair of pants five years ago, saying, yeah. Dear Bernard, as a member of the pair of pants call, yeah. yeah. I'm going, Wait, well, like you have been in touch with me for six years, or yeah, you know, exactly. I'm going, I have no part of your community, I'm not part of your tribe, you know. Uh, right. Or suddenly, 
suddenly you're using my name and you don't, you know, <laughs> I, or, or what, you know, I, a very chat, I got a very chat email the other day from an opera company. I can't name, I'm, as you know, I'm a big opera fan. I, in general, yeah. I support, it's one of my, we yeah. all have a vice yeah. and opera is my vice. Um, and it began, it didn't, they hadn't mail merged my name. So it just said, hi, just want to let you know how things are at the fly-by-night opera company. Well, we're having quite a hard time. We've had to lay off people. That's what I said. And so our new production is cancelled. Love, Liz, Jim, Fred, and Joe. And I want to write back and say, I'm glad you all have names. I'm right. sorry that you don't think I do or that you don't know how to use mail merge and MailChimp. Right. I'm, I don't really know who Liz, Jim, Jane, and Joan are. I'd be interested to find out. <laughs> Um, and I'm sorry your show has been cancelled. I'm fine, thanks for asking. Right, you know? right, yeah, um, exactly. And, and I kind of say, you're trying to write to me in, in a... Oh, oh, and the other thing is, sorry, the other thing I had to say is, is actually a company I'd made a donation to that I hadn't I hadn't been to see a show. I just made a donation because they okay. do some really good work in non-formal settings. So they wrote to me asking me to change... The thing said something like, if you've got a ticket, will you mind turning it into donation? And I'm going to turn back to this is the worst CRM in the right, world. Exactly. Like, you okay. Know, I don't no know. This, is, this is so rubbish. Yeah. Um, you know, buy a CRM, learn to do mail merges and MailChimp. Be in touch with me more than just this. Um, you know, so I, I'm hoping that one of the things that will come out of it is people saying, and certainly the advice I'm offering to lots of our clients is try and think think not about the next dollar but about the relationship you you know begin with the relationship you want to have in october or november or whenever this travel and then work back absolutely and you may well find people will give you gifts now because you're saying you know what in october when things are better we'd love you to come back and see our shows right. or we'd love you to come and visit the food bank or we'd love you to we'd love to send you our We'd love to send your impact report. I mean, the other thing I'm saying to people, stop sending, you know, XYZ NGO impact report. Start sending the Bernard Ross impact report. He's what you do, Bernard. Yeah. Because we have time to do that, right? That's that's yeah. the thing. Um, no, I think the that's, and work point. Back. that's a really yeah. excellent point. I had a, I, and I know you do work with the UNICEF. I had a woman from UNICEF USA who's their director of, of uh, uh, digital marketing branding um, here in, in based in New York. Um, speak in my class two weeks ago uh, at NYU and at New York University, and she was talking. She was sharing about something that they did. That I thought was really clever, and I and I shared it in the virtual um, mm. summit. She saw. She talked about how you know UNICEF typically speaks to they're they're providing services in developing countries, right? Um, and so they know all this wash stuff, all the stuff that you, all these strategies that you need right now. They know how to they know how to do all that. And they know how to communicate it, and they also know how to deal with children because they have mm -hmm. that's who they speak, that's who they deal with. And and one of the challenges as an organization that's here in the U.S. that's working in a, you know the, all of the operations are international is how do you make it relevant to the people in the U.S. you're trying to raise funds mm -hmm. from? And so what they did was they packaged together. Um, resources for different types of resources for how you can speak to your kids about COVID and how and how to stay home and you know how and then they also have like little activities they can do if you go on their on their very social oh, media okay. network, they, they're sharing that and I thought that was really smart because mm. they're not asking for anything necessarily right now but what they're doing is they're connecting to you and they're packaging something they already had so I'm like what can organizations think about the, you know the know-how they've got or or intellectual property or whatever that they've got that they can make make repurpose and make valuable to the supporters because mm -hmm. now is the time for you to be generous for you to give to be part of this because this so you're part of an ecosystem mm -hmm. uh, that eventually when you when things rebound you're going to see the results of that you're going to see positive results because it's not the time for you to kind of put your head down or just start begging for money like i was you know the professional beggar guy would say this mm. this is not the time to just be asking for funds it's really about building those relationships and really creating value and because there there's a lot of sorry go ahead no no you absolutely that. well what i was gonna say was that you've mentioned of course another one of these uh, heuristics another one of these behavioral science the principle of reciprocity so yeah. um 
uh, just for your for the listeners who don't know, uh, if I send you uh, a Christmas card and you don't send me one, and the Christmas card, oh my, you know, for the next 365 days, you are uh, guilty because you didn't send me one. Or if I yeah. bought you dinner, for example, you didn't buy me dinner, you feel you need to buy, that doesn't seem to work for you anyway. Blah, blah. Okay. So, no, so, but, I, but, you're, but you're picking my brain. So, like, <laughs> So the so rule of reciprocity is that if we give someone something up front, do someone a favor, they they feel a kind of moral, well, a, a moral to, to, to do a favor back for us. So by UNICEF, very cleverly, um, making a gift of here are some resources for you to help you with your kid or help with homeschooling. Big issue for lots of parents. Um, uh, I feel, oh, you did me a favor. I should do you a favor. You know, but but you need to begin by giving them the favor to engage the reciprocity act. So that's a great example. I see yeah. lots of agencies doing nice, um, some nice, some very nice things uh, like that. You know, the, so the zoo, for example, um, uh, giving people, you know, um, giving parents materials that they can use to entertain the kids. Uh, well, not entertain them just, but inter some entertainment things, just fun sure. things, and some things which are educational. Sure. Interesting. I'm talking to, um, I, I, I'm not going to name the company, but I'm talking to one uh, Shakespeare company. They do Shakespeare. And what they're planning to do, because they, they say, well, what can we do about Shakespeare? You know, like, can we read a sonnet to cheer people up? And I'm going, well, is that very, ch are many, sh so what I've, what I've suggested, yeah. to do, I don't know what they're going to do, is that they have advice lines that you can call up so if you're having dating problems, you can call up the Romeo advice line to get advice from Romeo. <laughs> or if you're having problems with your kids, you can call up the King Lear advice line to get advice on how to candle. Or if you're feeling slightly depressed, you can call up Hamlet. I mean, it's meant to be a fun thing. Know, yeah. uh, but the idea is that you, you're just saying, okay, you're going to call up this actor who's going to pretend to be Hamlet or King Lear or Mrs. Macbeth on, you know, persuading your no good husband to kind of like be a bit more ambitious you, you'll have five minutes of fun that's all and and the actors will quite enjoy doing it and that that's your gift because that's you can give the gift of humor i i, I was talking to them today and they were going mm, can we do that but I'm, so I'm really hoping they will because i think that's uh <laughs> because we are playful creatures we are also creatures who like i see you laughing because i think you know for people who would think that would be playful that would be quite fun it doesn't need to all be serious no, no it doesn't it doesn't because everything's so serious right now too i know i'm waiting for the first um the first uh you know comedy act to be damned for you know too soon too yes. soon for oh, too, yeah Ex no exactly um, um, um so so i need to start wrapping up because i actually have office yeah, yeah. but but yeah. leave us with a couple of thoughts you know what are some what do, what do you want to leave us with oh liz uh I, some of the things I began with that 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 learning I got from the um, from the terrible you know learning from a terrible mistake you know whatever we're doing in fundraising just now, I and I was again I was encouraging a couple of a customer today to say just try that you know what and try that and and one of them are won't work or both of them won't work, both of them definitely won't work but but be prepared to experiment. This is a time as you said. I agree. I mean, yeah. This is a time to experiment because nobody knows. I, I actually hate the phrase. I I think I had you men mention it once, but I'm going to best practice. Best practice to me is about history. It's about what used to work. Oh, yeah, we talked about that, yeah. We need, to, we need to say there is a new practice, and we, you and I and everybody else in this call is responsible for developing it. Try things, take risks, learn from the risks, learn from the risks. And then the second thing is, maybe I'm about to contradict myself, that's okay. Don't don't forget the basics. You know, those the basics about all this tricksy new stuff. And I, I'm going to give you a link to some resources people can mm -hmm. get. Uh, we're doing a big online seminar and stuff like that. Yes. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm participating okay. in it. I'm excited I, about I, it. Um, so that's good. But, but the basics of tell me, don't thank me for my gift. Thank you for being who I am, for being caring about Scotland or caring about girls having periods when I'm in the supermarket or yeah. uh, for being a good citizen or for being a, a good guy. You know, thank me for who I see myself as being. Um, 
and, and the gift is simply a way of me expressing who I am. It's the point you made earlier about, you know, this is part of us. Thank me for doing something that's part of me. Yeah, that's that's it. Yeah. Um, and I, and I, I thank it's you. It's a pleasure to talk to you, Liz. A, a definitely a pleasure as well. And and Bernard, and Bernard I'm using your name. Um, I'm not Bernie. <laughs> Don't call me Bernie. No. <laughs> no, no Bernie. Um, you know, I, I'm really grateful that we had this opportunity to connect in this way. Um, and I'm really grateful that you made the time and you're sharing all these resources with us. I'm looking forward to being to taking the course with you, the boot camp. Um, and and definitely, of course, collaborating again in the future. Um, and I want to just leave everybody with this is a quote. I know that I use it a lot. If you've heard me speak, you're like, oh, she's using it again. But I literally have it framed in my apartment. So it's not even it's and it's it's from Nelson Mandela, who I admired quite a you know, greatly. And it's, it's always seems impossible until it's done. Um, and I, and I feel like right now we're all really overwhelmed by so much information coming. There's so much negativity coming at us. Right. Um, and we also feel like, oh, this is going to be really difficult to, to, to overcome, but you know, um, this has been done before people have overcome before, uh, people have had to rebound again before. You don't forget in 2008, 2009, we had, you know, we had that global, you know, financial meltdown. It's obviously not a health thing, but we have been in a similar kind of a situation in a way before, and we rebounded. Um, and so I think that we just need to be positive. We need to access all the resources that are available to us, and we have to come together. Mm. We have to come together. And really, a lot of what you said, um, and 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 you know, keep our spirits up because this is it's easy for us to start going down. And you know, mm. once you start going down, then that's it. It's really hard to come back up. You know, emotionally. Mm. So. Just really trying to, you know, physically isolate, but not socially isolate. Absolutely. Yeah. So have a great weekend, and I look forward to being in touch soon. I'm going to go and drink some Corona beer now. Oh, enjoy. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Enjoy. <laughs> Thank okay, you. Bye-bye, bye -bye, everybody. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay.